I'm going to be talking a little bit about some history, and um, I, I need to I need to explain a little bit what this is about because I know that some of you who are watching this presentation are not from a Seventh Day Adventist background, but that is my background. I grew up as a Seventh Day Adventist, and although today I disagree with some of the things they teach. In fact, I disagree very strongly with some of the things. Yet, the truth is that I, I still identify more closely with Seventh-day Adventism than with any other group of religious people, or any other religious group that I, that I know of. So, I suppose in a, in a way, I still consider myself a, a Seventh-day Adventist, although the church would not acknowledge me as such. In fact, I would be considered a, a great apostate, you know. But, um, as I said, I, I believe in many of the things that 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 group of Christians stands for, even although I, I very much believe that they are wrong in some things. And I would like to see some changes, and that is a part of what I am hoping to accomplish in putting out these videos. But I, I'm saying this because I want I want to help you to understand that um what I'm going to, to focus on today has a little bit to do with the, the history of Seventh day Adventism. In fact, my, my message today is entitled, Wagoner's Other Legacy. I'm hoping I won't be too long, but this can get very involved, and I'm hoping I can keep it short, you know, and, and to the point. Well, fairly short at any rate. Now, to give you a little understanding of what this is about, over 100 years ago, back in the year 1888, Adventists believe that a special message came to the church and that this special message was carried by two, two young ministers by the name of Alonzo Jones and Elliot Wagoner. <clears throat> These men brought a message that has been widely accepted among Seventh-day Adventists as, as, as being a special message, something that focused on Christ in a very special way. It is believed that God used them to, to bring the attention of the church back to Christ as the center. That year the church had a, a general conference session when, when delegates came from all over the world and they met in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Now before the, the conference began, there was tension and there was disagreement because the, the president of the church, Elder George Butler, had taken exception to some of the things that Elder Wagana was teaching. It had been accepted by probably everybody in the church, most of the, 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 the theologians and the ministers, that um, in the book of Galatians, when Paul talks about the law, he is speaking specifically of, the, of what is called the ceremonial law. By this we, we mean the, the, the aspect of the law that had to do with ceremonies and rituals and types. Um, definitely not, in the thinking of Adventists, definitely not, the moral law are the Ten Commandments, because you, you know that Adventists believe that the Ten Commandments, the moral law, as they would term it, is something that lasts forever. It was always in existence and it will always exist. That's what Adventists believe. So, so they believe that, that, as Paul speaks about the law in Galatians, you know, he talks about the law being added and the law being, being intended to last for a certain time that this was not speaking of the moral law, but the ceremonial law. Now, Wagana came and Wagana started to say that in Galatians, Paul was speaking about the moral law, and this caused a lot of controversy. Letters were going back and forth between Wagana and Elder Butler, even before the conference started. So, when Wagana and Jones came to the, the, this conference, and Jones was in agreement with Wagana, when they came to this conference, there was a lot of tension, and, and, and people were prepared to do battle. In fact, when Wagana arrived at the, the meetings, he saw a, 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 ch a chalkboard set up, and on one side it was written, Resolved that the law in Galatians is the ceremonial law, and it was signed by a man named J. H. Morrison, who was a noted debater. On the other side it was written, Resolved that the law in Galatians is the moral law, and it was waiting for Wagana's signature. But, you know, Wagana refused to sign and he, he said he had not come to debate. He came to, sh to, sh to share what the Word of God says. So, 
Today, there is still controversy about what happened at that general conference session back there in 1888. People are always searching, Adventists are always trying to understand what message did these men, Jones and Wagner, bring to the church. The, the thing that has really made 1888 such a landmark issue is the fact that Ellen White, most of us know that Ellen White is regarded by most Seventh-day Adventists as being a special messenger of God. In fact, some would, would even label her as a prophet. Adventists in general place great stock in the writings of Ellen White and they believe that they are inspired and they are to be an authoritative source. Some even use Ellen White as the means of defining doctrinal beliefs. Now, Ellen White stated that the message that God gave to these two men, she used several several extreme phrases in referring to the message. She, she called it a, a most precious message. She referred to it as the message that God commanded to be given to the world. She stated that it was the third angel's message in verity. So, so with this kind of endorsement, of course, Adventists have always been fascinated by the message of Jones and Wagana, and, and they've always been trying to find out what exactly was it that Wagana taught at those meetings. Now, now, interestingly, it seems like Wagana did not really focus on the book of Galatians and the law in Galatians at those meetings. And why am I making this point? I'm making this point because there are some Adventists today who believe that it is critical that we come to accept Wagner's understanding of Galatians. I am not one of them. I, I have read Wagner's understanding of Galatians and I am very much in disagreement with Wagner. There are some of my friends and brethren and some of my opposers, I would say too, who think that this position is one of apostasy. And they would insist that Wagana is right and I'm wrong. So, I want to do a comparison today. I want us to look at what Wagana taught and believed. And I want us to see how it compares with the actual Bible. Because I believe that there are some misconceptions, some wrong ideas, some wrong conclusions. And even some dangerous positions being taken by people who have made Wagana's position on Galatians their foundation. I believe it is wrong. And I want to demonstrate today why I think it is so. Now, as I said, it's interesting that in 1888, Wagana did not speak about the law in Galatians. In fact, he has written a book. He wrote a book entitled um, Christ and His Righteousness. He published this about two years after the General Conference session. And most people agree that this book represents what he actually preached at the General Conference. And, and the, the titles of, of, of the chapters of the book give us some insight into what it is about. The book is available online. You can find it and download it anytime. It's called Christ and His Righteousness by E.J. Wagana. But here are the chapter titles. Chapter 1, How Shall We Consider Christ? 2, Is Christ God? 3, Christ as Creator? 4, Is Christ a Created Being? 5, God Manifested in the Flesh? 6, Important Practical Lessons 7. Christ the Lawgiver 8. The Righteousness of God 9. The Lord our Righteousness 10. Acceptance with God 11. The Victory of Faith 12. Bond Servants and Freemen and 13. Practical Illustrations of Deliverance from Bondage So, it seems clear just looking at the, these, these chapter headings that Wagana did not speak about the law in Galatians at the, the, the Minneapolis meetings. And this is not a part of the, 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 the message that was so was, was endorsed by Ellen White in such a superlative way. I'm making this point because as far as Adventists are concerned, this is an important point. And those of you who are not Adventists and you're you are watching this video, you know, I, I, it's hard for you to understand the Adventist mindset. But when it comes to Adventism, and especially 
those who are, who are independent in the Adventist movement, it's v the, the opinion of Ellen White is of supreme importance. Most of these brethren, these brothers and sisters, believe that if you ever contradict Ellen White in the slightest way, then this is a certain mark of apostasy. So, so in doing this presentation, I want, to make, I want to make the point at the beginning that even if we are to accept that Ellen White's endorsement is of critical importance, it's important to note that she did not endorse Wagner's position on Galatians. In fact, you know, Ellen White never made a, a definitive statement about the law in Galatians until the year 1900. That was about what? That was about 20, that was about 12 years after the actual conference in Minneapolis. And um, when she made a statement, in fact, when she made a statement, it, it gives me pleasure to notice that she, what she says is exactly what I believe. You know, I might phrase it a little differently, but here's what she said. I am asked, I am asked concerning the law in Galatians. What law is the schoolmaster to bring us to Christ? I answer both the ceremonial and the moral code of Ten Commandments. All right, I'm happy to, to see that this is the conclusion she came to because this is exactly what I see when I read the writings of Paul. I conclude that he's not talking about the moral law as such or the ceremonial law as such. What he's talking about is the system of the law. The system of the law, the entire system that was given at Mount Sinai, which embraces both the moral law as well as the, the ceremonial part of it, if you want to divide it up that way. The moral, the ceremonial, the civil, the health laws, everything is embraced in what Paul is talking about in Galatians. He's talking about the system of government that God gave to Israel at Mount Sinai. And what Ellen White says agrees with what I'm saying. Now, Wagana has been somebody I have, admi I have admired, and I'm not going to change that, because Wagana did a lot of good for Seventh-day Adventism. You will find that whenever people talk about righteousness by faith among Adventists, you find that whenever people focus on the issue of Christ and what he means to Christians, you'll find that the name of Wagana comes up. In fact, ministries have been established in, in Adventism focusing just on the work of Wagana. So, he's an important figure, and like I say, he has, done a, he has done a lot of good. He focused the attention of Adventism on Christ in a way which had never been done before in its history. He put Christ at the center. So, I'm not going to take that away from Wagana. But today I'm talking about Wagana's other legacy, the other side of what Wagana left with Adventism, which I think is not something you hear emphasized very often, and which I think is not something that Adventists in general emphasize. Because there was there was there was negatives to Wagana's position as well. That's what I'm going to try to bring out today. Now there are some people who treat Wagana as if he were uh, were almost infallible. You know, I think Ellen White's endorsement has, done, has resulted in, in this kind of attitude. But there are some people who... I, I have made enemies. I've had people who have almost been willing to physically attack me. I'm not exaggerating. There, there, there have been occasions when I've felt actually threatened because I, I questioned Wagner's position. That's the kind of authority that Wagner carries... And, and, I, and I think this is bad. I think this is something bad. I don't think any human being is to be exalted to that kind of position. Not even Ellen White. I don't think so. There's no, there's no, nobody that God ever used that was ever infallible apart from Jesus Christ. Every prophet made mistakes. No prophet was ever inspired 24-7. Prophets were inspired while they were speaking on behalf of God. When they were at home speaking to their families are, are out in the, in, in the world, it, it, it's, when the Spirit came, it's, it's when the Spirit of God came upon them that they were inspired. Otherwise, they were just normal people. They were not constantly wrapped up in vision or under the control of the Spirit. And, and this is a mistake that people make. 
all the time. This misunderstanding. But it's interesting to me that, that even Ellen White never gave unqualified endorsement to the message of Wagner, not, not even in 1888. In fact, there's a statement that Ellen White made, and, and it's taken from um, the 1888 materials. And here's what she says. He, referring to an angel messenger, he stretched out his arms toward Dr. Wagoner and to you, Elder Butler, and said in substance as follows, Neither have all the light upon the law, neither position is perfect. To that I can say a hearty amen. This is the conclusion my studies of the Bible have brought me to. Wagoner was wrong and Butler was wrong. I mean, they were both partly right. They were both partly wrong. But when you're partly wrong, right, you're, 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 when you're partly wrong, you're still wrong. And, and that wrong can result in great harm. And in fact, I think it has. I think it did. Now, let's look at the book of Galatians. And, and, and let's take a moment to look at what Paul is saying here. I'm not going to... I'm not going to look at all of Galatians by any means. That may be something for another day. I just want to look at a couple of verses which demonstrate what I'm trying to point out, you know, what Paul is really talking about. Like I say, Paul was dealing with the entire system of the law in the book of Galatians. What, what, what had happened was that the people in Galatia were being persuaded by Judaizing Christians. Jews came down from Judea. And they followed Paul around and they, they got to Galatia and they told the brethren, faith in Christ is not, is not enough. You have to start keeping the law. You have to be circumcised. You have to fe keep feast days. You have to do all the works of the law if you are to be accepted by, by Christ, if you are to be accepted by God. And, and this is what the book of Galatians is, is about. Paul wrote this letter to correct this heresy, to stop this heresy that was beginning to take root in the Galatian church. And, and in doing this, he tried to show how the system of the law, the system that God used to govern the Israelites, was supposed to be a temporary system. God never intended that system to last forever. He was not talking about this part of the law or that part. It's the whole system of government. Because you see, the Galatians were trying to put themselves under that same system. In, in, in Galatians 4 and verse 21, Paul says, Tell me, you who desire to be under the law, don't you hear the law? What he was saying is, you want to be governed by the law. Don't you understand what the law is saying? So it was a system of government Paul was talking about. So, he's talking about how God's plans moved along a timeline. There was a period... Before, but when people were not governed by the law, then they were governed by the law. Then the government of the law came to an end and they moved to a different system of government. That's the point. Now, there, there, there are a few verses that are very significant. They bring out this point very clearly. I want to just quote a couple of them. First of all, Galatians 3, verses 16 and 17. Here's what it says. <clears throat> now, to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not, and to thy seed, as of, as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. Uh, and this I say, that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ, the law which was 430 years after, cannot disannul that it should make the promise of none effect. <coughs> Now we look at the, the, the diagram here and we see that what Paul is saying is that there's a promise. The promise, we see that there was a promise made to Abraham. Actually the promise was first made in Eden but it was, it was repeated to Abraham. And then <clears throat> Paul says the law was 430 years after. The law came 430 years. It was given 430 years after the promise. And Paul says that this, this law that was added cannot cancel the promise and it cannot add anything to the promise so that the, it should make the promise of none effect in Galatians 3 and verse 19 it says wherefore then serve at the law what's the purpose of the law it was added because of transgressions till the seed should come to whom the promise was made 
and it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. So, referring again to our diagram, we see that the law was added. Paul says it was added because of transgressions. It was added at Mount Sinai. That was the time when the Old Covenant was made with, with, with physical Israel. And it says it was added because of transgressions. In other words, God has a plan to bless the world. And this plan is the seed of Abraham. The seed promised to Eve in the Garden of Eden. God has a plan. But until that plan is fulfilled, God needs a way to control these people that he has called. He called the Israelites out of Egypt. They are carnal people. They are accustomed to, to, to slavery. They don't know anything about freedom. God has to have a way to control them and to limit their, their, their bad ways. So what he does is he puts them under a system of control, a system of government called the law. The law was added because of transgressions until the seed should come. It was to last until the seed should arrive. In verse, verses 24 and 25, Paul says, Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after that, faith is come. We are no longer under a schoolmaster. So you, you, you see what he says as we look at the diagram again. We see that this law that was added at Sinai was intended not just to control the people's sinfulness, but it was also to be a schoolmaster. Now, a schoolmaster at that time represented a trusted servant, a trusted slave who was like a kind of governor. He would train the children, take them to school, protect them, be a kind of guardian. Now, Paul says the law was, was to serve this purpose. It was to teach them about the coming salvation, but it was also to protect them, to guard them, to keep them from destroying one another. That's the purpose God had in giving this law. And this was to last until the seed should come. Why? Because when the seed comes, God has a better plan in mind. He's not going to control people from the outside by laws and restrictions. What he's going to do is put something inside of their hearts. He's going to change their natures. He's going to put his spirit inside of them so that they, they will not behave because of external compulsion, but they'll behave because... Their natures are changed. They will simply do what they want to do on the basis of this new nature. And lo and behold, they will find themselves doing the right things without having to depend on these rules that were given in the law. That's what Paul is saying. Now, Wagana did not agree with this perspective at all. Like I said, I started out as a supporter of Wagana. In fact, I would have considered myself a die-hard supporter. Of Wagana. But I began to study the Bible carefully. I began to study the books of Galatians, Romans, some of these books very carefully, and I began to have some questions about Wagana. Well, I don't hold to that position anymore. What I consider that a harmful position that Wagana is infallible and that his, his teachings were without fault. He was not always right. Like I said, even in the year 1888, when he brought that great message to Adventism, he was still wrong in some things. And, and so I can, I can read his writings today and take the benefit from them, but at the same time, I'm on the lookout for the errors because we need to be aware that they were there. Now, I think that Wagner made three major errors. I mean, maybe there were more. I found three, okay? I've listened to his teaching, I've read his teachings and I've listened to those who support Wagana. And I mean, when I tell you that there are some people who regard Wagana as being almost a prophet, I'm not exaggerating. Wagana had three mistakes that I consider major. And he and his supporters, like I said, I've listened to them present these ideas. And it is listening to them present these ideas that, that made me begin to dig deeper into what Wagana said. And I was, I was, to be honest, I was, I was, I was appalled in some cases. I was disturbed and appalled in some cases when I began to see some of the things that he really said. And I believe everything stems from three major mistakes, three errors. And I'm going to, the, these three mistakes was one. He believed that Christ was effectively crucified the moment man sinned. 
back there in the Garden of Eden. You know, Revelation 13 and verse 8 says that Christ is the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Now, Wagana took this literally, literally, almost literally, because he believed that everything that Jesus came to give us in AD 31 was already available from the foundation of the world. Nothing changed when Christ came. That's the first major mistake he made. And I'll show you especially how this belief has caused a great deal of confusion and robbed many Adventists of some of the great blessings that God has given to us in our day. Secondly, he believed that when Christ was crucified, all humanity was actually placed inside of Christ. This is a very popular teaching, but I think it stems from Wagana. And it's a false teaching. I'm going to demonstrate how it is false. But he believed that when, when, when man sinned, Christ was crucified. As it says in Revelation, he's a lamb slain from the foundation of the world. This verse is, is in Revelation, but Revelation is a symbolic book. And I understand it to mean that Christ was promised from the foundation of the world. In, in the mind of God and in the mind of Christ, he was destined to die. He was sentenced to die. But it doesn't mean that the benefits that came from his death were all available at that time. Now, Wagner says that he, he was, he, the benefits were available from that time. And then he believed, the second thing, as I said, was that all, all humanity was placed, actually placed in Christ when he was crucified. Now, I don't understand how this could have happened. I've been trying to picture it, to visualize it, and my mind can't see it. And I'm convinced that he was wrong. But the point is, if all humanity was placed in Christ when he was crucified, and Christ was crucified at the foundation of the world, then it means that all human beings were already placed in Christ. From the beginning of the world, when man sinned, then all humanity was placed in Christ at the beginning of the world. And I'll show you one terrible false doctrine that developed out of that idea. And of course, the third error that Wagana made, we have mentioned already, is that he believed that the law in Galatians was the moral law, was exclusively the moral law. Now, here are eight false ideas that grew out of these three primary errors. And like I said, there may be more, but I'm just focusing on these eight because I've, I've taken note of these eight. First of all, we're going to believe that all men, even the vilest criminal, already possess the very life of Christ. Now, I don't mean that they have an understanding of Christ or they have some kind of idea of who Christ is. He means that actually inside of them, the life of Christ is dwelling, even the vilest criminal. So that when a person is murdering somebody or stealing something or raping somebody, Christ is fully in that person as much as he's in the strongest Christian. This arose from Wagner's idea that the life of Christ, that all men were placed in Christ the moment Adam sinned. So if all men were in Christ, Christ is in all men, and therefore everybody who is born into this world is born with Christ already in them. What Wagana said was that all we have to do is just to believe, just to know and understand the truth. And that's all, uh, all we need. I'll come back to that afterwards. Secondly, Wagana says that the coming of the seed, refers, referred to by Paul in Galatians 3 and verse 19, is referring to the second coming of Christ. You remember that verse says, Wherefore then serveth the law, it was added because of transgression, till the seed should come. Wagana said this is not speaking of the second coming of Je the, 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 the first coming of Jesus but it's speaking of the second coming of Jesus I'll come back to that thirdly he says that the two covenants were not something that were set up in a time sequence he says that you didn't have an old covenant that lasted for a certain time period and then a new covenant that came in after that point in time you read the book of Galatians, you look at the chart that, that, that I just showed a short, uh, a short while ago, and you'll see that Paul talks about a time when the law came in, and then a time when it ended. And at that time, the new covenant began. Wagana says, no, 
No, it's not like that. The, 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 the two covenants were not set up in a time sequence. Number four, he says, God did not establish the, establish the old covenant with Israel. It was not God who did this. Number five, he says that the old covenant existed before Mount Sinai. Number six, he says that the term under the law means only to be condemned by the law. I'm not going to discuss that in detail here, but if you look for the video on this channel entitled Under the Law, you'll see a more detailed presentation on it. And if you simply look up all the reference to under the law, references to under the law in the Bible, you'll see that Wagner was wrong. He says that the term means only condemned by the law, under condemnation by the law. That was wrong. Number seven, he says the new covenant, the one spoken of in Jeremiah, referenced by Paul in Hebrews 8, he says that this new covenant has not yet been made with the house of Israel. And number eight, he says that Jesus was born condemned by the law. Now, I'm going to, I'm going to refocus on some of these ideas of Wagana, and I'm going to read some of the things that he wrote himself to demonstrate that I'm not exaggerating and I'm not misrepresenting Wagana. There are some people who say, well, yes, Wagana began to develop some wrong ideas in the later part of his life, from the year 1900 and, and thereabouts onward. But it's important that we recognize that Wagana's later ideas developed from some of the things he believed earlier on. Wagana was a logical person, and when you are logical, you keep building from one point to the next. So, so the later ideas simply grew out of the earlier misconceptions. That's, that's what I'm trying to say. Now, Wagana believed that, as I said, he believed that Christ was slain from the foundation of the world in a very real sense. And so, all the benefits available to Christians were available to Moses and Noah and David and Ezekiel and all these men. Everything that we, is it, we are entitled to today and everything that we can experience today as Christians was always there. We're always there. So in other words, Christians are not unique in, God, in this timeline. When Christianity began, nothing new began. That's the point. Now here's what he says in, in, in his book entitled The Glad Tidings on page 97. He says, His death made no more change 1800 years ago than it did 4000 years ago. It had no more effect on the men of that generation than on the men of any other generation. It is once for all and therefore has an equal effect on every age. When he, was, when he died, a paper was found at his bedside, a little booklet with his last confession, his last confession of faith. And in this confession he says, Christ crucified was as much a reality and as available in the days of Moses and Isaiah as in the days of Paul, neither at the cross nor before or since has there been any new feature introduced, any change in the way for sinners to approach the throne of grace. Christ has from the foundation of the world been the Lamb slain. His life has always been the one perfect sacrifice for sin and his royal priesthood has been unchangeable. From the Confession of Faith by E.J. Wagoner. Now notice Wagoner says that his life has always been the one perfect sacrifice for sin and his royal priesthood has been unchangeable. This idea has resurfaced very forcefully recently. In fact, I never gave it much consideration but I always thought everybody understood Christ became our high priest after he ascended to heaven. 
But but it's interesting because I recently had discussions with brethren, some of my good friends and brethren, where I was amazed to find that they believed that before, before Jesus came here and lived and died, he was already our high priest in heaven. They believe that during the Old Testament period when when they were offering those animal sacrifices and worshipping in the earthly sanctuary, that Jesus was at the same time a high priest in heaven. And they believe that what he was doing here, what, what the priests on earth were doing, was simply a means of accessing the ministry that Christ was already carrying out in heaven. Now this was, this was amazing to me because in reading the Bible I certainly don't get that impression. But when I see Wagana saying here that his royal priesthood has been unchangeable from the beginning, I understand where the idea comes from. But I'm telling you that it's a false idea. And we'll just look at a few verses, especially from the book of Hebrews, which bring this out very clearly. In Hebrews 8 and verse 3, it says, for every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices. Wherefore, it is of necessity that this man have somewhat also to offer. Notice, notice the point. Jesus needed to have something to offer as high priest. If he didn't have this thing to offer, then he could not be priest. A priest offers blood, gifts and sacrifices. Christ's blood had to be shed. He had to have blood to offer. Now, I'm not saying that Christ literally offers blood in heaven, but whatever the blood represented, whatever the ritual represented, the equivalent thing Christ had to have, it necessitated the shedding of Christ's blood. That's what we are learning from the illustration. Christ had to have gone through this experience. Whatever it made available had to be available through his death. That's the point. Look what it says in, 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 in verse 6 of the same chapter, Hebrews 8 and verse 6, it says, But now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry. Notice the word now. Now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry, by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. So we see that Christ had not obtained this ministry until the time referred to as now. And when we read the book of Hebrews, it's very clear that the now referred to is the time after Christ ascended to heaven. That's when he became high priest. That's when he now obtained a more excellent ministry. Here's another point that is um, equally striking. In Hebrews 2 and verse 7, verse 17, Paul says, Wherefore, in all things it behoved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. So what he's saying here is that in everything, it was necessary for Jesus to be made like his brethren, in order for him to be a merciful and faithful high priest. So, the point is, if, if, if Christ had not been made a man, if he had not been made like us, he could not be a merciful and faithful high priest. That's the argument. I mean, you might, not, you might not like me using the argument, but it is Paul who is using the argument. And what he's saying is that if Christ had not become a man, if he had not become like one of us, then he could not have been merciful and faithful in his job as our high priest. So, again, the, the, the next thing we see there is that it's necessary for our high priest to have been one of us. If Christ had not become a man, if he had not been one of us, then he could not have been our high priest. That's what we see clearly taught in the scriptures here. So Wagana was wrong on this point. He was very wrong. And, and today, when you look at Seventh-day Adventism, and you see that truths such as the truths of the, the kingdom, the establishing of the kingdom when Jesus came, the, the kingdom of grace, and the outpouring of Christ's life at Pentecost, with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. To be honest, I was born a Seventh-day Adventist. I was born in the Seventh-day Adventist movement. And I can tell you that these things are given very little attention in Seventh-day Adventism. Even till today, I have come to understand these, these truths and I'm trying to, to emphasize them. But the response has been, to a large extent, 
negative. And, and the re- this is one of the reasons Wagner's perspective has blinded the mind to what happened when Jesus Christ came to this earth, lived, died, was resurrected, and returned to heaven and was exalted at the right hand of the Father. The meaning of this has been lost because <coughs> what Wagner, as far as Wagner is concerned, it meant nothing because everything was already available. All of these things were already available from the beginning of the world. <coughs> Let's look now at Wagner's position that Christ is in every person. <clears throat> now, Wagner believes that just as we were in Adam when he sinned, it must also be true that we were in Christ when he died. And we're going to look at a diagram illustrating his position in just a moment. But, <clears throat> you know, when Adam sinned, the Bible says, all sinned when Adam sinned. In other words, the effects of Adam's sin were passed on to all humanity. Wagner believes that in the same way, when Christ died, all human life was somehow placed in Christ. And that because of this, the end result is that Christ is already in every person. So, <clears throat> the life of Christ was, al- was already given to all men and it is just as fully in the vilest criminal as it is in the Christian. And here, here are his own words to that effect. He says in the Glad Tidings, on page 88, depending on which version you are, you are reading, <clears throat> it says, The difference then between the, the sinner and the Christian is this, that whereas Christ crucified and risen is in every man, in the sinner he is there, unrecognized and ignored, while in the Christian he dwells there by faith. So what he says is that the only difference between a, between a Christian and the sinner is that the Christian recognizes the presence of God, and the sinner does not recognize it. But he is fully in both of us. In fact, Wagner says that this is the sense in which Christ bears our iniquities. He says that in another place. So, So when a man is committing a crime, when he's committing sin, Christ is in him. So Christ is actually committing that crime as well through the man. In other words, he's bearing the, 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 the sins of this person, according to Wagner. <clears throat> you can see that if, if, if Wagner is correct, then nobody needs to be born again of the Spirit. Or, I mean, because we are, all, we, are, we are all already born of the Spirit. We are born, born of the Spirit the first time we are born. The Spirit of God is already in us. It's already in us, just as fully as, as when we, we are converted and become Christians. And so all a person really needs in order to be born again, in Wagner's understanding of it, is that he needs to receive information. He needs to be told, listen, Christ is in you. He needs to be told, listen, Christ has already saved you. You already possess the life of Christ, but you just need to believe what is already true. So the new birth is not God giving him anything at that point. It is not the Spirit of God coming into him at that point. It is not him becoming a part of the life of Christ at that point. Because this was already all true from the beginning of the world. So you understand, the truth of the new birth is hardly, if ever, emphasized by people who are supporters of Wagana. I remember meeting a brother in Australia who, who, who claimed, and still claims, that all babies are born in a sinless condition because they are born with the life of Christ. Because, and of course, he's, he's an avid supporter of Wagana. He believes that Christ the life of Christ was, was given back to humanity from the foundation of the world. And so all men already possess this life. And he, he quoted the verse in, in John 1 and verse 9, which says that Jesus Christ is a light that lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Which, of course, is nonsense. Because what the verse is saying is that Jesus shines on everybody. Jesus, the Spirit of Christ, is working to draw everybody to Christ from outside. Not that the Spirit of Christ is in everybody, but that the Spirit of God is pleading with all men. 
influencing all men, trying to woo all men and draw them to himself. Not that every man is already born again. So, so, but, but that is the position that a person needs to take if he accepts what Wagner says. <clears throat> now the true picture, I'm going to take a moment and look at the true picture because I, 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 Wagner believed in the doctrine of the two Adams. And so do I. In fact, I believe the doctrine of the two Adams is one of the most important doctrines in the Bible. Although it is not emphasized in many places, I mean, the idea of the two lives is all over the New Testament. But actually, to refer to, 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 to it as the two Adams, I believe, it's just two places mainly in the Bible that we find it emphasized. Paul talks about it in Romans chapter 5 and in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. But of course, the concept is everywhere. Now, we're going to believe in the two Adams. But how he, he applied it, like I said, he believed like when Adam sinned, we all were in him. So when Christ overcame sin, we all were in him. This concept does not make sense. It does not make logical sense. I, 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 I tend to have an artistic mind. I, I like to visualize things. You give me an abstract concept, I try to visualize, visualize it. If I can't visualize it, I have a great difficulty in understanding it. And if I don't understand I can't have faith in something that I don't understand. That's the way my mind tends to work. Now, when you say that we all were placed in Adam, I can understand that. Or we all came from Adam. If you look at this diagram, you can see Adam is one person, but you see a flow of life coming from Adam into all humanity. Adam passed on his life to, to Seth, and Seth passed it on to his son, and that son passed it on to the next one. And all of Adam's children, it was one stream of life flowing from one person. And so that life that came from Adam, whatever condition Adam brought upon that life, it, it was passed on in that life. If Adam caused that life to be polluted in some way, the life that was passed on was polluted. His children were born in a state of sin, in a condition of degeneracy, with minds that were carnal, with weakened moral power. That's what... Adam passed on to his children. If he had not sinned, this would not be the kind of life that they inherited. But you can see this picture and it makes logical sense, reasonable sense. You can even look at it from a physical point of view. You can look at genetics and understand how it's a good illustration. Because if a man is, 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 has knock knees or, or a big head, genetically these traits are passed on to his children, may be passed on. And it, it helps us to understand how Spiritual attributes may also be passed on through inheritance. So, <clears throat> the picture of Adam passing on his life makes reasonable and logical sense. But we look at the next picture, and here's how, what Wagner believed. He believed that all humanity was placed in Christ on the cross. But notice now in this diagram, the arrow is going from humanity to Christ. In the first diagram, the arrow came from Adam to humanity. It was moving; Life was moving in a logical direction. But now, Wagner has it, life moving from humanity to Christ. How does that happen? All humanity was not placed in Christ. Christ received humanity from one human being, Mary. And that you, so, so Christ became a human. But it was not the entire race that was placed in Christ. It was just one hu human being. And what he got from Mary was a human life. Not the life of all human beings. There were many human beings living at the same time when Christ was conceived. They were not put inside Mary's life. They were not put inside Christ's life. There were many human beings who, who were already dead. And many who were not yet even born. And when they were born, they, did not, they were not born from Jesus Christ. They were born from human mothers and fathers. So, there's no logical way in which you can visualize how the life of all humanity was placed in Christ. The true picture is what we see in this diagram. Here you see Adam passing on his life to all humanity. And here you see Christ passing on his life. But to whom? Not to all humanity. He's passing on his life to all humanity who believe they are the ones who receive the life of Christ. 
when Christ went back to heaven, he became a, a, a life-giving spirit, according to 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 45. The last Adam was made a life-giving spirit. So now the life that is in Christ, that victorious, conquering life, he is able to pass on to humanity. There is enough life in Jesus Christ for all the human race. But is that life in all the human race? No, no, no. That's the mistake we're going to make. Now the life of Adam is in all the human race. Because all the human race was born from Adam. But not all the human race is born from Christ. So it's not all the human race that possesses the life of Christ. It is only those who choose to be born again. Those who are born into the new humanity. You see, what God did was he made a new human race in Jesus Christ. He designed a new human race in Jesus Christ. Adam represents the old human race. Now, in, in Jesus, God started a new race. And this race is the race that is the descendants of Jesus Christ. It's a race of people who are both divine and human. Because in Jesus, there was divinity combined with humanity. And in this divine human race, Christ conquered sin, overcame the devil, died to sin, and was re resurrected as the firstborn of this new race. He went back to heaven, was placed at the right hand of God, and he was filled with the Holy Spirit in immeasurable measure. So that now, with all the power of God, he's able to, to impart this life to all who will believe and who will receive it. Like it says in First John, that... As many as believed, as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. So, so this is what he did. So there's a new human race. That little white rectangle represents a new human race. And this new human race is a race of divine human beings. The, 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 Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ is a firstborn among many brethren. Those who receive his life are his brethren. They are his children, they are also his brethren. And this is a true picture. So, <clears throat> when a man comes to Christ, he needs the new birth. He doesn't have it already. What he needs is not just information. He needs to be born of the Spirit. This truth has been obscured by Wagana's error. And it needs to be corrected. This, this, this false doctrine needs to be corrected. Because too many people... Too many of our brethren are simply legal believers. They think, that, they think that imbibing doctrine is what Christianity is about. They take in this doctrine, they study the law, and then they go and they try to obey. They don't understand the power that comes when a person receives Christ. They don't understand the wonder of the new birth. They don't understand the marvels of the kingdom that Jesus Christ came to establish. They don't understand that we are no longer mere humans. They don't understand that we have a new nature which hates sin and loves righteousness. So now we no longer serve God on the basis of rules. We serve God from a, the, the new nature of sons and daughters of the living God who possess his own nature, his own perspective, who love the things that he loves and hates and hate the things which he hates. So, this is the truth. We are no longer a part of the old life. We have been been born again. So Paul says in, in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 17, Wherefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. I understand that the Greek says he's a new creation. He's a part of the new creation. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And I have to make an important point here. Again, looking at what Wagana says. This life of Jesus Christ was never available before Jesus Christ came to the earth. I mean, before he came to this earth, Jesus Christ, yes, he was, he, he was the Son of God. And he was able to, he was God's representative who was working with humanity. And, and he passed on this power of the Holy Spirit to many human beings, many times. Samson, Elijah, Moses, they had the power of the Holy Spirit. But I want, I want to show you, there's a difference with the life of Christ. When Christ came to earth, he became a man. It was a human being who conquered sin. It's a human being who is at the right hand of God. It's the first fruit of humanity. Now, this life of Christ that saves, 
is a human life. It's the life that overcame sin. The life in the Old Testament of Christ did not save, could not save, because the life of God alone cannot save man. The life of an angel cannot save man. It takes a victorious human being to redeem us from where the, our first father, the first human being, put all of us. It takes humanity combined with divinity to save humanity. So the life we receive was never available before Pentecost, was never available before Jesus actually lived this life. We need to understand this. So our privilege is far greater than that of those who lived before the cross. And I'll comment on that a little more shortly. Now, Wagner's misunderstandings continue. And Wagner actually says that God did not make a new covenant with his people at the time of Christ, at the time of during the year AD 31. And this is pretty amazing because when you read what Paul says in Hebrews chapter 8 and chapter 10, it's hard to understand how Wagner could say this. When you look at Jesus' statement, this cup is the New Testament in my blood, the new covenant in my blood. Jesus came and established a new system, a new agreement, a new method of God dealing with his people. And the New Testament is full of it. Now, Wagana says that all the blessings were available from the creation. So, of course, he concludes that the new covenant was also available from the beginning. So, you know, when Jesus came, there was no new covenant. The new covenant was always there from the beginning of creation. You know, but the Apostle Paul tells us in, in, in Hebrews 9, verses 16 to 17, Paul says, For where a testament is, the word testament here means covenant, for where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is of force after men are dead, otherwise it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. Now, he, he's speaking especially of a covenant and, and, and comparing it to a will, the last will and testament that a person makes in his old age in preparation for his death. And he says, look here, such a covenant has no, no force. It, has, it is not effective until the person dies. Nobody can come and claim what is written in my will until I die. It has no effect until I die. That's what Paul is saying. So, what he's saying is that the new covenant that God made with his people could not be in force until Jesus actually died. So that, that right away negates Wagner's position. The, the new covenant was something that had to take place at some time future to the time when, when, when the, the, the promise was, was, was made. The promise was made to Abraham. The promise was made in the book of Jeremiah. But it was an experience which had to wait until a certain time. Wagner is taking out the time element. Wagner is saying the, 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 the covenant was there from the beginning. And in actual fact, he says, both the old and the new covenant were there from the beginning of the world. He says they didn't have to do with time periods. And yet the Bible tells us it's an experience that had to do with time. That's what we saw in Galatians. But here we see that in the book of Jeremiah, um, God says the same thing again in, in, in chapter 31, verses 31 to 34. Here's what God says. Behold, the days come, said the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was an husband unto them, said the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, said the Lord. I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor, and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. Again we see God making the same, a similar promise in Ezekiel 36, verses 24 to 28. He says, For I will take you from among the heathen, and gather you out of all countries, and I will bring you into your own land. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, 
and you shall be clean. From all your filthiness and from all your idols will I cleanse you. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you, and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you shall keep my judgments and do them. And you shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers, and you shall be my people, and I will be your God. Now the point I'm making in quoting from both these passages is to show you that this promise of a new covenant had to do with the future in both cases. It's not something that always existed. It was, it was something God would establish with his people in the future. The promise from Ezekiel talks about God taking people out of different lands and bringing them to their own land. And many people take this to mean that they're actually going to physical Palestine. And this is the way we misunderstand the Bible because in the Old Testament, the physical places and the physical terminology are often misunderstood. In the New Testament, our land is the heavenly Jerusalem. The, our promised land doesn't have to do with this earth. When God speaks about taking you out of all countries, the Bible makes us understand because the Bible talks about God's people being in Babylon, being in Egypt. He doesn't mean literal Babylon or literal Egypt. He means spiritual Babylon, spiritual Egypt. God says, I'm going to bring you out of these countries. I'm going to bring you to your own land. Your own land is Zion, Jerusalem, the true spiritual land of Israel, which is where we go when we leave Babylon. We need to understand what we read. So, so, so he's saying at this time, this is what God, God did in AD 31. He took his people out of spiritual confusion and he brought them to New Jerusalem. That's what Paul says in Hebrews chapter 12. You have not come unto the mountain that burned with fire. You have come to the heavenly Jerusalem, the city of the living God. This is where God brought his people and poured out his spirit on them and established the new covenant. It was something that had to do with a point in time. And that point in time came in AD 31. Wagana did not agree. And so Wagana said that the, the covenant was set up from the beginning of the world. But of course, Jeremiah says it's something God will do in the future. So we're going to find a way of explaining that as well. He said, well, you see, what, 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 what Jeremiah meant, what God meant to say was that he's not saying that the new covenant is not already made. He's saying it is not already made with the, the whole house of Israel. He's talking about Israel as a corporate body. That's how we're going to explain it. So he's saying God is going to make this covenant with Israel as a corporate body. And that has not been done yet. It has only been made with individuals from creation coming right down. And so he says this promise in Jeremiah is applying to the end of the world. So here's what he says. In his book, The Everlasting Covenant, on page 529, he says, No soul is yet under the new covenant, for that has not been made. But everyone who keeps God, God's covenant with Abraham will surely be among those with whom it is made. So surely as Jesus died and rose again, and by the power of that death and resurrection will all Israel be gathered, and the new, the everlasting covenant, be established with them. Again he says in the same book, same page, when the new covenant shall be made, all Israel will be present there. Will be present. There will n there will be none not gathered, and our God shall come and shall not keep silence. So when God comes with all the angels to make a new covenant with the, with the whole house of Israel, the heavens shall declare His righteousness. So we look at this diagram here, illustrating Wagana's view of the covenants, and we see that Wagana Wagana believe that. The two covenants, the new and the old covenant, existed from Eden and will exist right back until the establishment of the, king, the kingdom of glory when Jesus comes the second time. And he sees that as being the time when the seed arrives. So, the things that happen in between, look at this list and you see that the promise was made to Abraham, the law was given at Sinai, and Christ came, all these events were in Wagner's timeline 
have little significance. They made no difference. They made no significant difference. God's plan was set up and fulfilled at the beginning. And the only time there will be any real change is when Jesus comes the second time. So you see, he, he just wipes out everything that happened in between. The law given on Mount Sinai, the, 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 the first coming of Christ when he established the kingdom. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about the kingdom, but, but let me go back to the law given at Mount Sinai. If, if, the, if the giving of the law at Mount Sinai was not a temporary measure, as Wagana, as Wagana's teachings suggest, then what it means that is that all the things that were given at Mount Sinai were intended to be permanent things. At least that is the way some brethren are now understanding it. The people who are keeping feast days are using Wagana as one of their strongholds. Because Wagana says that the giving of the law on Mount Sinai, the giving of the law was not, was not something that was intended to be limited for a certain time. When Paul says that the law was added, Wagana interpreted the word added to mean spoken, not added, because he says the law that was spoken, the law that was given on Mount Sinai was always there. It was only spoken on Mount Sinai. You see how his concept that, that Paul is speaking of, the moral law, begins to create confusion. Because he says, what Paul is talking about is the moral law. So, so wherefore then serveth the moral law? What's the purpose of the moral law? Wagana says it was always there. Adventists believe it was always there and will always be there. So it could not have been added at that point. So he changes the word added to spoken. But in doing this, he's also opening the door for all the other laws that were given at Mount Sinai. They were spoken until the seed should come. And Wagana says the coming of the seed refers to the second coming of Christ. So feast keepers and others who are in love with the law, laws of Moses say, you see, Wagana was endorsed by Ellen White. Wagana was the hero who brought the message of righteousness. And Wagana teaches that the law given on Mount Sinai was not something new. And it was not something that was to pass away when Jesus came the first time. It was to last right up until the second coming of Christ. So Wagana, in this teaching, has done a great deal of harm to the truth and opened the door for the fallacy of feast keeping. But the Bible teaches very clearly that God made a covenant with, the, with, the, with, with Israel at Mount Sinai and that this covenant is called the Old Covenant and it came to an end at the time of Christ. That's not something that we need to be confused about. Paul speaks of the Old Covenant in the last verse of Hebrews chapter 8. In verse 13 he says, In that he saith a new covenant, he hath made the first old. Now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. Translate the verse. Put it in modern terminology. What he's saying is, when God talks about a new covenant, what it means is that he now regards the first one as an old covenant. Now the thing that is old and is, 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 is rotting away is only fit to disappear. That's what Paul is saying. Here he's showing you a clear timeline. Here he's showing you that the old covenant is gone because a new covenant has come. So, the, the, the real difference with what Wagner was teaching and what Paul, what Paul was teaching and what I believe is that Wagner denies the time element in the two covenants. That's the main difference. He saw the two covenants as simply referring to a personal experience that we individuals, we can have individually. He says, look, you can be seeking to be saved. You can be seeking to approach God through works. Doesn't matter what kind of works. Any works of the law. You can be seeking to approach God through works. And if you are doing this, then you are under the old covenant. But if you are seeking to approach God through faith in Christ, then you are under the new covenant. So, this is what it always was from the beginning to the end of time. He says the two covenants were just a matter of personal experience. The Bible teaches it was not a matter of personal experience. 
The Bible teaches that it was a matter of time periods. God was taking the world through a timeline. God was taking the world through different experiences because the plan of saving man was developing in stages. Now look, I understand nobody was ever saved by keeping the law. Never happened, never could, never did. When God gave Israel the old covenant, it was not in order to save Israel. God never saved anybody through the law. It was to govern them and control them. It was a system of government. It was a part of God's plan. The stage of development of, of, of Israel necessitated an iron hand. And that's what the old covenant was. You don't think it was an iron hand? Let me, let me ask you. Why did, God, why did God give the verdict that if somebody was caught breaking the Sabbath, he should be stoned to death? Why? Why was God's why were the penalties for breaking the law so harsh? You don't believe it was, it was because of the condition of the people? You don't believe it was a temporary system? If you don't believe it was a temporary system and it was, it was intended to be for carnal, hard, stubborn people, then what you will conclude is that we still have to live by those penalties today. And I'm going to tell you, I've met one at least one feast keeper who believes that. He believes that... <laughs> Amazingly, the only reason why we don't carry out these penalties in the same harsh, uncompromising way is because we don't have the authority to do it because of the government. But, but this person's heart believes, he believes that this is the kind of nature that God wants us to have. This is the kind of attitude God wants us to have. And this, this, this demonstrates a total misunderstanding of what God was doing. God's timeline moved until the Messiah arrived. That's when God's perfect plan was put in place. I'm not saying people were not saved before Jesus came. I'm saying they had the promise of being saved, but they never actually experienced what salvation is because it wasn't a reality till Jesus came. And all who lived before Christ, from the time of Mount Sinai to Christ, they had to submit themselves to the system of the law because that was God's way of governing his people. When Jesus came, he put a different system in place. So you see, if you, if you take out this timeline, then Pentecost loses its meaning. Pentecost was something that had, had never happened before, had never been available before. But according to Wagana, this is not true. The gift of the Spirit that came at Pentecost was always available. So there are many verses in the Bible that he makes null and void. This is how Wagner put it in, in, in the review. In, in 18, 1898, he wrote an article in the review, Advent Review on Sabbath Herald, in which he says, We see then that the two covenants are not matters of time, but of condition. Let no one flatter himself that he cannot be under the old covenant. Because the time for that is past. So, so Wagana says that it is we who decide which covenant we are under. It is not God who makes that decision. But the Bible says that it is God who established these two covenants. In, in, in Exodus chapter 19, he says that he came to make a covenant with Israel and Mount Sinai. In Exodus 19, Exodus 34, it shows you that God made this covenant with Israel. And... In Jeremiah 31, he says he will make a new covenant with Israel. Two covenants that depended on time periods. So Wagana was wrong. In the first covenant, everything was type and illustration and shadow. The new covenant is the reality. In the first covenant, it was truth illustrated. In the new covenant, it is truth itself. So, John says, in John chapter 1, I think it's verse 6, he says, For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Now, at this point, I, I, want, to, I want to acknowledge that the two covenants can be applied to an individual's experience. It can be applied this way. It's just like, Paul says that your body is the temple of the living God. And so you can take the, the sanctuary that God told the Hebrews to build 
And you can take the fact that there's a ministry in the sanctuary in heaven and you can apply it to your, your soul, you as an individual. But you acknowledge that this is not the primarily uh, this is not the primary application. This is not what the illustration and the symbol means in the first instance. In the same way, the two the two covenants can be applied to an individual's experience. In fact, Paul does it in one place. In Romans chapter seven, he speaks about himself as being alive without the law once. <clears throat> But then he says, then the commandment came, sin revived and I died. Then he was under the law. He was, he was in an experience where he was trying to, to relate to the law, to, to, to submit to the law, to keep the law. And he couldn't. And then he says, but, but then he, he met Jesus Christ. And he says that Christ set him free from that system and from that law. And he was, he was, he was, he was liberated. So you have before the law, you have under the law, and then you have after the law. So you have the experience of the two covenants outlined there in, 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 in his individual experience. But this is not the main meaning. That's the point I want to make. In the New Testament, the law and the old covenant are overlapping. They're, they're, they're considered as almost the same thing. In fact, many times, or sometimes when referring to the law, the Bible really refers to it as the, the, the Old Covenant. And sometimes referring to the Covenant, it refers to it as the Law. And I'll give you a, a, a couple of examples of this. One of the most striking ones is found in Second Corinthians chapter uh, 3, verses 6 to 8. It says, Who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit? For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. But if the ministration of death, written and engraven in stones, was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away, how shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious? Here you see that Paul says, God has made us ministers of the New Testament or of the New Covenant. And he goes on to explain the difference between the Old and the New Covenant. He says, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. Now when he talks about the letter, he's speaking of what is written. And he's saying, we're not ministers of what is written. We are ministers of the Spirit. The living life of Christ is what we have been given the task of ministering or of sharing with others. Because he says, the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Now the, the next verse is significant. It says, the ministration of death written and engraven in stones was glorious. He's speaking about the Ten Commandments. The Bible tells us that the Ten Commandments contain the words of the covenant. That's what we are told in Exodus and in Deuteronomy. God wrote the words of the covenant. So the, the, the law itself with the Ten Commandments representing the whole system was regarded as a covenant. And Paul says that this covenant, this, this ministry, was glorious, but he says that the thing that we are called to minister is more glorious, much more glorious. We also find in Galatians 4 and verse 24 where, where Paul speaks of the covenant as being represented by Mount Sinai. And we all know that Mount Sinai represents the giving of the law. He says in, verse, in, in 4 and verse 24 of Galatians, which things are an allegory for these are the two covenants, the one from the Mount Sinai, which gendereth to bondage, or which produces bondage, which is Hagar. So, the new covenant is a new system of the law. It's a new system of government, which has been brought by Christ the seed. So, the old covenant is an old system of government. It has to do with external rules. The new covenant is a new system of government. It has to do with Christ himself ruling from the inside, producing righteousness not by the letter, but by the Spirit. In this system, God writes his laws, or, or his very nature, his own character, on the minds of his people, on the hearts of his people, by baptizing them with the Holy Spirit. Now, Wagana failed to grasp this. Again, he lets me down. He interprets Galatians to be speaking of the moral law only, not the covenant, not, not the system. 
He says in, in, in 1888, he says, I believe most emphatically that the law referred to is the moral law and that the coming of the seed is the second advent of Christ. But I do not believe that the moral law is going to terminate when Christ comes. And Galatians 3.19 does not indicate that it will. So while he believed that it, it pointed to the second coming of Christ, he, he gave the, the exception that the moral law would not end at that time. Therefore, of, as I said, he rejected the idea that the law was limited to a certain point in time. He found a way to interpret Galatians so that the time element was removed completely. So, here's how Wagner reinterpreted some of the statements in Galatians. When it says the law was added, in Galatians 3 and verse 19, he says the law was spoken. He says it means spoken, not added. When it says till the seed comes, he says that this coming of the seed refers to the second coming of Christ. When the Bible says, when Paul says that we were under the law, in Galatians, he says it means we were condemned by the law individually. He says at this time, the law was our schoolmaster because in condemning us, it forced us to find Jesus Christ to put an end to that condemnation. When, when God told Abraham that all nations will be blessed in your seed, how did Wagana understand this? Well, Wagana says that this blessing this blessing of the seed, really, because you see, God made it, made it clear that this blessing was a future blessing. Wagana says that the covenant was already there from creation. So when God came to Abraham and, and he said, in your seed I will bless all nations, future tense, what did God mean? If all the blessings were already there from creation, what is this blessing to be given? And so Wagana interpreted that to mean that at that time in the future, we are going to inherit the land of Palestine. Because God promised Abraham that he would give the land of Palestine to him and to his seed. Wagner says this promised blessing is a blessing that deals with real estate, with land, with property. And so you see, he, he completely destroys the truths that came in AD 31, the blessing of what came in AD 31. And he denies, virtually denies, the kingdom of Christ. And so, like I said, among our people, there's very little awareness today of what happened 2,000 years ago. It's almost like just a blip on the radar of history and nothing of great significance. And so today we don't look for those privileges. We don't understand them. We're not excited about Christ and the kingdom and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. All of this is a legacy, the other legacy that Wagner left with Seventh-day Adventism. Let me tell you, brothers and sisters, that Jesus Christ brought, already brought, a new age to this planet. When Jesus came, things changed on this earth forever. It has never been the same for God's people. I want to just read a few verses here that bring out this point. You can't explain these verses if you don't accept what I'm saying. In Matthew 11 and verse 11, Jesus says, Verily I say unto you, Among them that are born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist. Notwithstanding, he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. So, John is great. He's the greatest up to that point in time. But those who are in the kingdom are, are, are greater than he. When is this kingdom and how is it that everybody, the littlest one, the least in that kingdom, is greater than John? And yet John is greater than all who lived before. What is this kingdom and when is this kingdom? It doesn't make sense unless you understand what Jesus says in Luke 16 and verse 16. He says, The law and the prophets were until John. Since that time the kingdom of God is preached and every man presseth into it. So Jesus explains, when he says, the kingdom of God he's talking about since the time of John. It's an experience that becomes available. It's some stage in the development of God's work for humanity that becomes available since the time of John. Up to the time of John, it's the a, it's a law and the prophets. And all who lived in that time, the greatest was John. But since that time, God, Christ is now preaching the kingdom of God. And the least in that kingdom is greater than all who lived before. Now, now 
this is not just uh, an isolated statement because throughout his ministry, this is what Jesus preached. When he began his ministry, he spent his, his ministry preaching about the kingdom of God. It says in Matthew 4 and verse 17, From that time Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And, and he, he explains that the kingdom of God had arrived with his coming because he says in Luke 11 and verse 20, But if I with the finger of God cast out devils, no doubt, the kingdom of God is come unto you. So when he arrived and he began to do these miracles and he began to cast out devils, he was overthrowing the kingdom of Satan. He was making it known that Satan's dominion had come to an end. He had come and had brought the kingdom of God. When he was questioned by the Pharisees about this kingdom, he explained the nature of this kingdom. In Luke 17 verses 20 and 21 he says, it says, and when he was demanded of the Pharisees when the kingdom of God should come, he answered them and said, The kingdom of God cometh not with observation, neither shall they say, Lo here or lo there, for behold, the kingdom of God is within you. He was referring to the kingdom of grace. He was referring to the coming of a kingdom on the inside by the coming of the Holy Spirit. This is what John was speaking about in, in, in John 1 and verse 17. I gave the wrong reference earlier on when John says, For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Jesus spoke of this experience over and over. In John 7 verses 38 and 39 he says, He that believeth on me, as the scripture had said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given because that Jesus was not yet glorified. We can't read these verses and think that nothing different happened when Jesus came. Wagner was wrong. And those who accept Wagner's teaching are robbing themselves. Not only of the privilege of understanding, but the privilege of experiencing what Jesus came to give. See, Jesus says, in John 14, verses 15 to 17, If you love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But you know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. Jesus promised the coming of the comforter, the gift of the Holy Spirit. He was with them, Christ was living with them at that time, but in future he would be in them. This is the experience of the new covenant, brothers and sisters. This is the experience of the kingdom. It is our privilege as sons and daughters of God, born of the Spirit, to live in the reality of this kingdom. But this experience has not been available at any time before this. This is what the book of Revelation is speaking about in Revelation 12 verses 9 and 10. When Jesus went back to heaven, he cast Satan permanently out of heaven. In John 12 and verse 31, when he was going to the cross, Jesus says, Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. Satan still had opportunity to go to heaven, back and forth. But when Jesus was resurrected and went back to heaven. He was permanently cast out of heaven. No more he had any place in the affection of the angels. No more he had any place in heaven. And it says in Revelation 12 verses 9 and 10, And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come let me read that again. Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. Brothers and sisters, let us take note of the word now. It's important. These things had not been available before. It is when Christ returned to heaven, having conquered sin, Satan, death, and the grave, that Satan was permanently 
cast out of heaven. At that moment, the following things became available which had not been available bef- available before. It says, now salvation has come. It wasn't available before. It had only been promised. Men died with the expectation of receiving it one day. But they didn't have it. They will have it in the resurrection. Salvation has come. Strength came to God's people. Now the power to cast out devils, heal the sick. Resurrect the dead. Cast, uh, cleanse lepers. These things came to, go- to God's people through Christ. Now the kingdom of God has arrived. A different system where we no longer live as mere human beings. We live as citizens of heaven who experience the powers of the world to come. And now has come the power of his Christ. Up until this time, Satan had been the legitimate ruler of this planet. But now the prince of this earth was cast out. And and, and Jesus says, in Matthew 28 and verse 18, it says, Jesus came and spake, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. In, in, in 1 Corinthians 15, it says that God has put all things under his feet. Now, this brings us to the end of this presentation. I know it has been long. I've had to divide it up into parts, but there was a lot to say. And I needed to say it properly. I needed to, to establish the case for what I'm, I, I'm, I'm suggesting. You know, I, I hope that we can consider this truth without bias. That the testimony of the scriptures is greater than all of us. We need to come to the Bible with an open mind and with an honest heart. It, it, it's not good to have an attitude where we set our beliefs in stone so that even the word of God cannot move us. Today, many of us are finding a, a foothold in Wagner's teaching. And many are even holding on to feast days and using Wagana to defend them in this practice. But we need to be honest and, and we need to free up our minds. We need to get out of the box where we have been locked. The thinking that everything that was done by a certain person or a certain group of people was flawless. The time is past when we should just be blindly loyal to a denomination, to philosophies or to certain men. It is time, brothers and sisters, that we learn to listen to Christ and to Christ alone. We are approaching a time of terrible crisis and only those who have fortified their minds with the truth and nothing but the truth will be able to stand in that last conflict. God bless you. Thank you for listening. I hope you have understood and appreciated what has been shared.